part three. Here I wound up preaching a three-sermon series, three sermon series in the middle of a bigger service uh, series that I completely did not expect. God's just kind of handed this one to me as we've gone through these last few weeks. And I opened up this conversation looking at the resume of God. We, we came to... God and His majesty. Looking at His titles and considering who He is. Majestic, awesome God. And then the next time we came together, we beheld His glory. And we looked at the transfiguration and we looked at that Christ was God in the flesh. That the Father at the Transfiguration allowed Jesus to be seen by the disciples in His glory. And we beheld that glory. And from that, we gleaned that God's desire for us when we see God's glory to listen to what Jesus had to say. And so that gives us guidance then that we are to worship His majesty and that we are listening to Him to proclaim His glory. Well, there's a third behold that He's given me and it's already on the wall behind me. Behold is coming. God created everything we messed it up with our sin, and He is transforming it back to His holiness through the cross of Christ. But that's not the end of the story. The Christian life is not, hey, you're messed up, get cleaned up, have a nice forever. There's a bigger hope. There's a bigger dream. There is a promised return. If you have spent any time in the New Testament reading, you have tripped across at least one reference in every author to the coming of Christ. And in our modern church, I think that we all too often miss this reality. How many of us Really expect it. Miss Gopher, Groundhog Day. You know, we get up, we go to work, we do our thing, we have dinner, we go to bed. We get up, we go to work, we do our thing, we come home, we have dinner, we go to bed. Oh, I might actually read the Bible today. I might actually have a little time of praise and prayer and worship, and I might actually acknowledge that God was in my day today. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I'm fairly sure that there's been at least one day this week you got through without acknowledging God. Why? Because it's Groundhog Day. We just get up and we do. And we forget the promises of His Word. Now, you can see there that I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Acts chapter 1. We're going to stay there and we're going to come back there. I'm going to venture a little bit through the Scripture. I remember as a child in the 70s, a commercial of a ketchup bottle turned sideways. And in the background was the song Anticipation. It's making me wait. Just waiting for that drip of ketchup. It's like fall already. Are we that way about the coming of Christ? Is the coming of Christ a future event that is beyond us? Is it something that my grandkids are going to enjoy? You see, I wonder how we come to this promise. Do we live expectantly? Do we anticipate? I mean, 
I'm sitting here right now thinking about what's going on after church and what we've got going on in that meeting and this meeting and I got to run home and I got to do that and we got to be back here for Sunday night service and this is going on and that go- and Jesus could come back before I finish this sentence. Do we keep that in mind? Do we live in that expectation? I remember some years ago Tim McGraw wrote a song about his father that I think touched on this idea. You remember live like you were dying? You realize, of course, that you might not finish today. You realize that you could die today. You realize that Jesus could come back today. You realize you might not see sundown today. Are you living like it? We seem to fall into the habit of living today as though tomorrow is a promise. And so I want to challenge that this morning. I want us to begin to think about what it looks like if we as individuals and then we as a corporate body begin to live like Jesus really is alive and He's coming back and we'd like that. To actually live like He's coming back. Maybe today. I mean, is that the first thought? Oh, I'm awake. Good morning, world. Lord, thank you for the day. Throw my feet off on the floor. Stand up. (laughs) Okay, we'll try again later. Because one of these times I'm going to do that and not come down. Because when he shows up, we'll meet him in the air. Join me in Acts chapter 1. Just three verses. And I'm going to bookend the sermon this morning with these three verses. What's happening in this opening chapter of Acts is Luke is reviewing what happened at the close of his Gospel and how Jesus was taken up into heaven. Jesus' final words of encouragement and commission to His disciples. And we pick up in verse 9, and after he said all of this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen Him go into heaven. (laughs) Happy dance! Okay, some of you guys are still asleep. We need to start the coffee earlier on Sunday mornings. This same Jesus who ascended back into heaven is coming back on the same escalator. He he got, and he's going to, so get busy. I want us to hold our place here, but this angelic, we we kind of assume that two guys dressed in white were angels because they suddenly appear and then they're suddenly gone and we're not told anything more about them. These angels are picking up on something Jesus laid down. And so I want you to to, to kind of keep your place here, but we're going to go back to Matthew chapter 24. A lot of people reference Matthew chapter 24 by itself, but I want us to look at Matthew chapters 24 and 25 together because it is the most inclusive teaching on the return of Christ that Christ ever gave. This this is a sermon that he preached about what it would look like when he returned. Now the problem with this story is that the disciples were running off the mouth. And they asked him three different questions. Instead of one question, get the answer. One question, get the answer. One co- they said, 
Three, three questions. So Jesus did what they asked, and he answered all three questions at the same time. And so it's important that as we're studying this later, in your own private personal studies, that you remember when you're reading chapter 24, the timeline that Jesus is laying out is both for the destruction of Jerusalem and for His second coming and for the end of the age. Because the disciples are asking three different questions all in one bundle. And so He just answers all of them, and leaves it to us to tease out, well, that one's been fulfilled, but that one hasn't as we go through this prophecy of Christ. Picking up in chapter 24, and I'd encourage you to just read along with me as I read out loud. I'm in the NIV. If you're reading from a different version, the wording may be slightly different. And by the way, if you're taking notes, this passage from Matthew chapter 24 and 25 is echoed in Mark chapter 13. It's also echoed in Luke chapter 19 and in Luke chapter 5. So, the synoptics, all three tell the same story of Jesus' teaching. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when His disciples came up to Him to call His attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things? He asked. I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to Him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Oh, guys, one question, please. But we get all three. And Jesus answered. Watch out. That no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed. That's just CNN. Such things must happen. But the end is still to come. There's a lot of folks that go, wait a minute, there's wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes in diverse places. It must be the end of time. He said, no, that's the beginning of the birth pains. That's been going on my entire life. How about yours? Well, that's not really a big signal to us. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginning of birth pain. Then, you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of Me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house Go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or, or there He is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear 
and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. See, I have told you ahead of time. So if anyone tells you, there he is out in the desert, don't go out. Or here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, there will, the vultures will gather. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And He will send His angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather His elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No, no one knows about that day or hour. Not even the angels in heaven. <laughs> not even me. Nor the Son. Only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken, and the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time the thief... Uh, wait, sorry. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming... He would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect Him. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the Master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose Master finds him doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. And in an hour he's not aware of, he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping, gnashing of teeth. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like Ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom! Come to meet him! Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. And he replied, I tell you the truth. I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Again, 
It will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. And then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought another five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one talent came. Master, he said, I knew you to be a hard man, harvesting where you've not sown and gathering where you've not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you know that I have harvest where I've not sown and gather where I've not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. And then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed by My Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see a, you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. And he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger, or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. And then he starts the Passover. There's a lot of points to be gleaned from those two chapters. Here's the ones I want us to focus on this morning. One, he's coming back. Two, you don't know when. So stop pretending it's in the future. No man knows the day or the hour. And then he spends the next chapter going through three different scenarios of people who were ready for his return. The whole message that he's giving these disciples is this. Be ready. 
be ready. Get ready to get caught doing the right thing. Don't do the wrong thing thinking you'll have time to repent. Because he might show up in the middle of you messing up. Be ready. Live every moment as like, now, 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 now. I mean, we used to pray for it in school. You all remember, <laughs> teacher, lay that math test on your desk. You were like, oh God, now. Please don't make me take this. Now? Now. You see, I'm going to suggest to you that we live like our plan is plan A and His return is plan B. And I want to suggest to you this morning that we should live like His return is plan A. And if that doesn't happen, I've got some other things to do. I'm going to live my life as plan B. I'm going to worship, I'm going to work, I'm going to praise, I'm going to interact, I'm going to witness, I'm going to live for the kingdom in everything that my hand finds to do. I want to do it to the glory of the Lord. But that's just because He hadn't shown up yet. Get into the mindset of what that looks like. Luke, in his writings, said, Be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or toward daybreak. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect Him. And Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? And the Lord answered, Who then is the faithful and wise manager? whom the manager puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time. It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all of his possession. But suppose the servant says to himself, my master's taking a long time in coming, and then begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and an hour he's not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. The servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. And some of you are sitting here this morning thinking, I don't want to get beat up by Jesus. How come this religion thing is always about doing the wrong thing? Why is it you pastors always work on guilt? Get over yourself. I know that if I jump off of a cliff, I will probably not live. So I don't jump off cliffs. It's not like, oh, everybody's just trying to throw me off the cliff. No! It's not about... You're messed up, so God's going to kill you. That's Zeus, that's Greek theology, and that's not in the Bible. God is always faithful to give us a way out, and that way out is Jesus Christ and His Holy Spirit that gives us the strength to do what He's called us to do and to turn our backs on those things He's called us not to do. It's not about, I'm going to get messed up, so i got to watch out because God's mad at me. It's all about God loves you enough to say, come here and get away from the danger. I'm coming back for you. I love you. I want you to be with me. 
As a Christian comedian said back in the 1980s, if you go to hell, you paddle your own canoe. Stop and think about that. If you go to hell, it's because that's where you wanted to go because God's given you all the options in the world to not go there. All you got to do is place your faith in Him and do what He's asked us to do. I love the way He follows this up in John chapter 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in Me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with Me so that you may be where I am. Guys, I want you to see the difference from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It's not big. It's just a simple direction. You see, in all of the Old Testament, God was over here because of the people. And He said, I want to live with you. I want to live with you. I want to live with you. Build a tabernacle. Build a temple. I want my place to be your place. That's the whole movement of the Old Testament is God coming to us going, I want to be with you. I want to be with you. I want to be with you. The entirety of the Old Testament is, come on, y'all, we're going to my house. Come to me. I don't, I'm not going to come to you anymore because your world's messed up. I want you to come to me to live in paradise with me in the place that has been prepared for you since before the creation of the world. Come live with me in holiness. For Thessalonians, Paul writes to the church in Thessaloniki. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. According to the Lord's Word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Let for it. Encourage one another with these words. Today could be it. Today could be it. Hey, you know, Jesus is coming back. Today could be it. We might not see the end of the day. Wouldn't that be glorious? Y'all still asleep. Come on! I'm going to heaven. Y'all are like, I don't know. I want us to start having that mindset that gets over the doldrums of just sitting in the water, bouncing, waiting for the wind to come up. We have this hope. Jesus is coming back. And I'm afraid my grandkids are going to miss it. Because I want it to happen in my lifetime. I want to be here. I want to see it from this high. I have had the idea in my head, and I don't know where it came from. I'm not giving God the credit because it could just be the child's imagination. But I've always thought, I don't think I'm going to die. Why? Because I'm going to live forever? No, because I think He's going to come back before I get to a tombstone. I want to see Him. You know what? I didn't get to see Jesus show up in Bethlehem. I didn't get to go worship at a cradle. I didn't get to sit on a hillside and listen to Jesus speak. I didn't get to see the cross. I didn't get to celebrate the resurrection. I didn't see the creation of the world. I didn't see all of the incredible things that God did in this book. There's another one coming and I want to be there. I want to see it. I want to see the sky split. And I want to see Jesus. It cracks me up. People are like, you know, I think I might. I'm not sure if we'll miss the rapture. How will you? It says like will lightning that happens in the east is seen in the west. In other words, 
It doesn't matter where you are on planet Earth. When Jesus comes down, you're going to see it. It's going to happen. And it could be today. It could be today. It could be today. I want to start living life like the agenda of the Great Commission and loving the Lord my God was plan B. I want plan A to be, come on, Jesus. Come on. Let's go. Today? Can we go home today? Can I get a couple of my... Wait, hold on just a second. I need to go get my neighbor. You see, the Great Commission and the loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength comes out of the reality that no man knows the day or the hour, and it could be in the next five minutes, and I know he's lost. I want him to go with me. I want that person to know heaven like I know heaven. I don't want to be standing up there because Jesus comes back and goes, hi, I'm here. And it's like, wait, I didn't get to tell. And then such and such is standing there and he winds up on the goat side looking over at me on the sheep side going, why didn't you tell me? Because I thought I had more time. No man knows the time or the hour. He could come back right now, right now, right now, right now. We need to live not like we're dying, but we need to live like He is living and coming back. We need to make every moment count. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul writes, all this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled, and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with His powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the Gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might on the day He comes to be glorified in His holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you're be you believed our testimony to you. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of His calling and that by His power He may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. We pray that this same, the name of the Lord Jesus, may be glorified in you and you in Him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to Him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or a word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anybody deceive you in that way. For that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that I was with you? I used to tell you these things. And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he's taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with his breath, with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. James picks up the idea in his fifth chapter of his letter, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. First Peter in his first letter writes in chapter 5, and when the 
chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In Peter's second letter, in the third chapter, he writes, above all you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it's been since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of the water by the water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth were reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt into heat. But in keeping with His promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. I want to give you a quick thought before I go into my conclusion, and that is this. Peter just wrote something here that's really kind of cool. He says we can speed up the second coming of Christ. How? By witnessing to everybody that's going to receive. Because when that threshold gets met, when the last person who is going to receive Christ hears the message, clock's over. You want heaven to come? You want the day of the Lord to show up? Get out there and get busy. Let's get the Word of God to the people of this world so that they might turn to Christ so that we can all go home. But don't think that it's waiting and completely on you because God's like, And it comes like a thief in the night. We might be like, well, I don't know. It hasn't fulfilled chapter 6 of Revelation, and we haven't seen this, and we haven't seen that. And Jesus shows up, and you're like, wait. I, no, you're early. And he's like, no, you just misread the book. No man knows the time or the hour. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. After Jesus said this, He was taken up from their eyes and a cloud hid Him from their sight. And they were looking intently up to the sky as He was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee. First Christian Church of Eureka Springs. Why are you standing here staring at the sky? He gave you a job. He went away. He's coming back. Get busy. That's what those three verses are all about. We are to be a people who get caught doing what God asked us to do. Love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to go out into all of the world and preach the Gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what we're supposed to get. You're like, wait, i got to pay the electric bill. Yes, you do. Go to work and witness. Take your paycheck to Walmart and witness. Cash it at the bank and witness. As you are going into the world, witness. Because there is not a person on this planet I want to have go to hell. I don't hate anybody that much. What I want us to see is that we are being invited by Christ Himself in His teaching to do a daily rapture practice. Now? Okay, then I'm going to go do this really quick. Now? No, okay, then I'll go do this really quick. Now? Okay, okay, we'll, we'll go back to... Now? Live for the return of Christ. Fill in the time doing what He asked you to do. I want to close out with Six passages from Revelation. 
Behold, He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see Him, even those who pierced Him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of Him. So shall it be. Amen. Remember therefore what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Behold, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Heavenly Father, as I close out this session, help us to see the words of this message. How it applies to our attitude in towards life. That we might be a people who look forward to Your coming, not as some future event, but as the next possible moment. Help us to live our lives as though the weight of the world and its salvation depended on our witness. Lord, we know that You've given the church the responsibility to spread the Word and we work in concert. Some speak while some rest. Others pray while others work. Lord, there's all sorts of activity going on in the body of Christ. But help us to not become dormant Help us to not get caught in the doldrums of living Groundhog Day and just doing what we do morning till night, morning till night, morning till night ad infinitum. Help us instead to see that this might be the day. This might be the moment. And there are folks around me who do not know You, who have not heard the Gospel. And that's my job. Lord, I pray I pray that someday I might be right in the middle of this prayer of someone taking you on as their personal Savior and the sky split and we just go straight from there. Oh God, help us to live our life as though your coming were eminent because it is. And we'll thank you for it through Christ our Lord. Behold His majesty. Behold His glory. Behold His promised coming. And go live in it. Amen.